big welcome to day five of the 2020 ASINS retreat. Already, it's the last day. And hasn't it been really great? I'm Susanna Cram, an AI at the QUT ASIMS node, and it's my privilege this morning to be chairing this session that showcases just some of the incredible research being conducted across ASIMS. We have five outstanding speakers, each of which will have 12 minutes to present, followed by three minutes for questions. So please do feel free to type questions into chat during the presentations or raise your hand during question time. Our first speaker is Dr. Chris Vanderheide from UQ. Chris completed a PhD in mathematics at UQ, currently is a postdoc at the UQ ASEMS node, and will present to us on Shadow Manifold Hamiltonian Monte Carlo. So thank you, Chris. Feel free to share your screen. Okay, thanks very much, Susanna. And also a quick thanks to the organizing committee, um, not only for the opportunity to talk today, uh, but also for the great job you've done in organizing this virtual retreat. So as Susanna said in the introduction, my name is Chris Vanderheide, and today I'll be telling you about a new sampling technique. Um, that we've developed. So this is joint work with Liam Hodgkinson at Berkeley um, and also Fred Rooster and Dirk Crozer here at UQ. So I'll, I'll begin by speaking a little bit about MCMC in general before giving a review of HMC and its Romanian variant. Uh, I'll then describe the advantages of shadow-based techniques and introduce our new algorithm, which we term Shadow Manifold Hamiltonian Monte Carlo. So since their introduction, Monte Carlo integration and MCMC have proved indispensable in the toolkit of statisticians, physicists, and applied mathematicians. As a key example that I'm sure that everyone is familiar with, um, many problems in Bayesian statistics can be cast as integration of some quantity with respect to a known, but usually unnormalized probability measure. In the basic case with the data set X and model parameters theta, we have the posterior is proportional to the product of the likelihood and the prior. So say we wish to numerically approximate the integral of some test function, which is analytically intractable. MCMC provides a way to do this. We can draw a bunch of samples from the posterior in order to obtain Monte Carlo estimates. Depending on the quality of the samples, we can then guarantee convergence to the true integral value, provided that n here is large enough. And again, depending on the quality of the samples, we can obtain uh, law of large numbers or central limit theorems, all of the good stuff. So this is often due in, of particular interest uh, when we're dealing with sparse data sets. And due to the prohibitive cost or time constraints or some other reason, it might not be feasible to gather more data. So one of the major pitfalls, however, is the so-called curse of dimensionality. So largely due to the way that volume scales exponentially as dimension increases on the one hand, uh, combined with concentration of measure on the other, sampling performance of MCMC typically degrades quite rapidly as the dimension of the problem increases. So one approach to mitigate this issue is known as Hamiltonian Monte Carlo. Uh, inspired by collision processes in physical dynamical systems, HMC allows us to draw samples from far apart in parameter space and accept them with high probability. So say for example, we want to sample from a probability distribution that can be written as a negative exponential of a smooth potential function U. In order to do so, we first extend our space to incorporate a fictitious momentum variable for each dimension of our space. So in analogy with physical momentum, we endow the momentum space with a kinetic energy function K. And we then define the Hamiltonian as the sum of the potential and kinetic energies. Provided that the right-hand side uh, here can, is integrable, uh, we then obtain a joint probability distribution in theta and P. And you can see here that if the Hamiltonian can be split like this into a sum of a function that depends on u and one that depends on p, then uh, this Hamiltonian density, uh, the parameters theta and p are going to be independent in that density. Now, if we're at some point theta naught, we can sample p naught um, from the conditional density and 
evolve these points along trajectories solving Hamilton's equations. That, and that, no, those are given in these ODE on the screen here. So repeating this process ad infinitum, we obtain a, a piecewise deterministic Markov process. We can then sample along a lattice of times to obtain an MC, MCMC algorithm. Uh, so when we allow the kinetic energy as the negative log Gaussian density and fix the covariance to vary depending on the position variable, we obtain what's termed Riemannian manifold Hamiltonian Monte Carlo. The covariance matrix is typically taken to be some variant of the Fisher information. So this borrows from information geometry, where the parameter space is interpreted as a Riemannian manifold of statistical models. This procedure has several key properties. Okay, so the first of which is conservation of energy. So what this means is that the value of our Hamiltonian function at our initial point um, is preserved a lot, as long as we stay on a trajectory of Hamiltonian dynamics. The second property is reversibility. And the third property is called symplecticity, which we can think of as being volume preservation. However, it's a bit more uh, refined than that. So conservation of energy guarantees that the Hamiltonian uh, density is a bona fide PDF. Reversibility then ensures that the process is, itself is reversible, modulo some technical points, and also guarantees, which guarantees stationarity of the Hamiltonian density. So volume preservation then becomes important in simulation because it means that we can avoid computing an expensive determinant term. However, only in very special simple cases can we compute the exact, exact trajectories of Hamiltonian dynamics. This necessitates the use of numerical integrators, which have known structured errors. So by choosing a symmetric geometric integrator, we then retain reversibility and symplecticity. However, conserv conservation of energy typically fails, and it only holds up to the order of the numerical integrator. Since our Hamiltonian is no longer conserved, we need to ensure that our sampler is still targeting the correct density. Um, the way that we do this is to use the Metropolis-Hastings correction. To do this, we draw a new sample, um, or we propose a new sample, sorry, by simulating the Hamiltonian dynamics. We can then accept this sample with a probability that depends on what we term the Hamiltonian drift. That is, how much the value of H has shifted along our simulation. This drift typically increases with dimension and is large in regions where the potential function becomes poorly behaved. Uh, for example, um, a situation that has both of these uh, pathological behaviors is in Bay Bayesian hierarchical modeling. All right, so we need some strategies to fix this. Um, there are a number of strategies that can be used to mitigate this. First of which is that we could decrease our step size. Um, the second strategy we could take is to use a higher order numerical integrator, a more accurate integrator. The third strategy asks if we can find some kind of, uh, if, is there a way to leverage the structure of the area in, a Ham, in the Hamiltonian to our advantage? And this is the one that we take. So strategies one and two um, are both very computationally expensive. So you can imagine that if we want to integrate up to the same time t, if we have a far smaller h, we need to do um, a lot more like computation to get there. Similarly, if we want to increase the order of numerical integrator in order to take one step, we need to do a lot more either function evaluations or gradient evaluations or both. The third strategy here asks if we can find some kind of closed form Hamiltonian type function that's conserved up to this higher order. This function is known as a shadow Hamiltonian. 
and it depends on the choice of numerical integrator. So the leapfrog integrator that's commonly used in the case where um, the position and momentum variables are independent has no shadow Hamiltonians up to arbitrary order. However, shadow Hamiltonians corresponding to the generalized leapfrog integrator used in Romanian manifold Hamiltonian Monte Carlo um, have so far gone unreported in the literature. So to this end, we have the following theorem. So if H is a smooth Hamiltonian function, then the fourth order shadow Hamiltonian corresponding to the generalized leapfrog integrator used in RMHMC is given by this expression here. So we can see that uh, by this h squared term here, that this function is of second order in the step size h. And you'll have to, I guess, trust me on this, but when we compare this to the um, shadow Hamiltonian for the regular leapfrog integrator, the only difference is sort of this third term here. And you can see that this, the, third, the extra term has uh, second order cross derivatives. So what this means is that, again, if u is only a function of theta and k is only a function of p, this term vanishes. So what we, obtained, or what we have obtained here is a pure generalization of the um, regular leapfrog case. Okay, so by replacing the Hamiltonian drift by the shadow drift in the Metropolis correction, we can then significantly boost acceptance probabilities. Uh, as a technical point, this is now sampling from a related shadow density rather than the Hamiltonian density. So we need to use post hoc um, sample reweighting, very important sampling, um, to get back to our, our correct density. So in this image here, on the left, um, you can see the Hamiltonian drift that's incurred when sampling the Bayesian logistic regression model. This was done on, I think, the Australian credit data set, uh, and here you can see it's 2,000 samples. So on the right, you can see the corresponding um, acceptance probabilities, which are, are much higher than just for the, the regular RMHMC case. This translates to increased effective sample size and time normalized effective sample size using standard benchmark data sets. Okay, so you can see here that in most of these cases, um, we, I guess, win, but we, we have increased performance uh, on acceptance probabilities, minimum effective sample size, as well as minimum effective sample size per second. Chris, we are just on 12 minutes now, so if you could just wrap it up with fairly soon. Oh, sorry. Yeah, no, this is, okay. Um, so this is all done while exploiting the geometric nature of RMHMC. Um, and here we have an image of a 30 dimensional funnel. This was proposed by Radford Neal. Um, this sample captures the pathologies that are typical of Bayesian hierarchical model, modeling. Um, it's an example where HMC typically performs poorly. You can see on the left here that it doesn't actually sample down into the neck. Uh, however, since our model uses the same dynamics as RMHMC, we're, we're able to obtain, uh, I mean, identical or almost identical neck penetration. Okay, so like, I apologize for going over, so I might just um, leave there and open the floor up to any questions. Thanks so much, Chris. Really interesting work. Um, so if anyone has any questions, you're welcome to enter them in chat, or please just raise your hand. Um, just open my participants page. Um, hi, I have a question. I can't raise your hand for some reason. Is it just here? Sorry, I can't hear you. Could you please repeat the question? All right, can you hear us at UTS? Yes. All right, KD, come closer to the speaker. Oh, it's a good idea, sorry. Um, so I have a few questions because you mentioned hierarchical models. Um, we just say HMC uh, is challenging for HMC to sample. So I wonder, um, I have two questions. One is that, what is, um, what is the computational cost of this uh, shadow HMC comparing to uh, the Romanian uh, HMC, the Romanian um, manifold HMC and when you have things like the new return samples? 
And also, um, when you have a hierarchical models, if you reparameterize the problem, would it be easier to sample rather than trying to have a more complicated uh, MC and model? Okay, so I'll just answer the first question. The computational cost. So because the extra calculations are really only happening at like once at the start and once at the end of the trajectory, um, the computational cost ends up being negligible. And that's why we're seeing um, this increase in effective sample size per second is because I guess the increase in, in acceptance that we're getting um, corresponds to better effective sample size. Uh, however, the amount of time that it takes is really only these computations that start in the end of, of, um, of the trajectories. So I guess when we're looking at um, more complicated geometries, typically you end up taking a lot more, like a lot longer trajectories and a lot more um, steps in your, um, along each path. And so that really mitigates the extra cost that is incurred um, by having to compute the shadow Hamilton. Uh, and your second question, I'm not quite sure, something about reparameterization in um, hierarchical models. Yes. Um, and so what, what was the actual question then? So I just wonder, um, would that be more efficient if instead of uh, trying to, for example, sam sample of this toner, you kind of try to limit we the problem, so it's easier to sample from the posterior. We have a posterior that's easier to sample. Oh, sure. I mean, look, um, look I'm, I'm really not sure, and that's probably going to be problem dependent, to be honest, right? And operator dependent because, you know, the effort that goes into the reparameterization, um, these samplers can be very finicky. And RMHMC, honestly, um, is, can be quite touchy in order to get it working. But when you've got it working, it works really well. Right. Um, and but that is also why you know maybe Stan the implementations are just like nuts because it's a it's a black box thing that is a lot more straightforward for practitioners and operators to get something working um, rather than to get something you know working with this level of precision. But yeah, I think the answer is a resounding. It depends. Awesome. Thank you so much. So our next speaker is Dr. Ursula La from Monash. Ursula is a research fellow at Monash University, where she's working with the Department of Econometrics and Business Statistics and with the School of Physics and Astronomy. She holds a PhD in particle physics and her current research interests focus on the application of statistical data visualization methods to problems in physics and on the development of new tools for the visualization of high dimensional data. So her talk is titled Reversing the Cures of Dimensionality in the Visualization of High Dimensional Data. Thank you, Ursula. Uh, hey, uh, good morning, everyone. Um, so yeah, I'll be talking about uh, visualization of high dimensional data and uh, kind of connected actually to the previous talk mentioning the curse of dimensionality as well. Um, but I actually want to start with a quick reminder because actually um, two years ago in the retreat, um, Dai Cook was discussing an open problem that is somewhat related to what I'll be talking about. Um, so what she was mentioning is that um, we have this kind of open problem of finding hidden structure in high dimensions with visualization. And she was using cakes to, to illustrate that. So um, for example, we can have some p-dimensional object and we can see something really beautiful or interesting from the outside. Um, but whichever way we turn it, we uh, might never learn what's actually hidden inside. Um, and so if we just take that cake and cut it open, we might find some beautiful structure that we were not expecting. Um, and the same is true with um, just any data distribution that we have. We don't really have good tools for looking at what's hidden on the inside. Um, and uh, even further, so if we have something that's in three dimensions, um, everything still kind of makes sense. We know how three dimensions work, but once we go to higher number of dimensions, we start to get these additional effects of, uh, for example, everything starts to pile up more near the center uh, and it looks much muddier and um, more uh, difficult to see what's going on. Um, and that's where we're actually having this connection with the curse of dimensionality. Um, and so probably most of you uh, are familiar with it in the context that we just heard about in the previous talk, which is um, this difficulty for optimization because of how um, the volume of space grows exponentially as we're adding more variables. 
um, which just at some point becomes infeasible for sampling, for example. Um, and another consequence that is important for statistics is that um, when we have high dimensional samples, most points tend to actually be really far away from the mean. Um, and if we have small sample sizes, well, they are actually um, usually found at the edge of the sample space. Uh, and now what's interesting is that in visualization, the opposite thing is happening, which uh, is what was illustrated with that the third cake on my previous slide, is that more and more things start to pile up near the mean, um, near the center of our projected distribution. Um, so here's an example to illustrate that. What I've done here is I've taken, um, I've sampled points that are in hyperspheres. Um, and so P is the number of dimensions of my hypersphere. So I'm going from three to 10 and to 100. And I'm just looking at how um, the density of points is distributed when I'm projecting onto a two dimensional plane. Um, and what you can see is that with the three dimensions, that's uh, fairly flat. Um, but as I'm increasing number of dimensions, things start to pile up more and more near the center. Um, and 100 dimensions, that becomes really extreme, where I should say that the color scale here is actually on a log scale. So it's even more extreme than what uh, it looks like in these plots here. Um, and so the question is, why is it so contradictory? Why is um, space so empty in, uh, near the center in high dimensions, uh, but everything starts to pile up near the center with uh, projections? And the way that I like to think about this is in terms of the projected volume. Um, so it's difficult to think about it in p dimensions, but let's just start from three dimensions and let's uh, think about it in terms of a sphere. Um, and so here I have this diagram that uh, should help with that. So we can think of our sample space being this um, three dimensional or we can even think about it in terms of a p dimensional sphere that has a radius capital R. Um, and then we're interested in um, the volume that is near, near the center. So I've drawn a second sphere here in blue with a smaller radius r. Um, and if we're comparing the volume of that small sphere uh, in blue with the big one, it's always going to be um, much smaller um, near the center. Um, but when we're projecting down, and so here in three dimensions, you can think of just putting a plane through the center of the sphere and then drawing a circle on that plane. So that circle actually has the same radius r as my small sphere here in blue. Um, but now since I'm projecting the volume, I'm actually integrating over this orthogonal direction that is indicated here. Um, and I get this full um, cylinder volume, uh, which is indicated in red. Um, and so that's actually going to be a large fraction of my total volume. Um, and so another way to look at this is then um, as a function of the number of uh, dimensions, which I'm calling P here, how much of the volume is within a fraction of the total radius. And so in the high dimensional space, so comparing the small blue sphere to the total um, big sphere with the radius capital R, here's what's happening. So as I'm going from three to 10 and 100 uh, dimensions, more and more of the volume is actually being pushed out towards the maximum radius. Um, whereas in uh, the projected volume, so I'm always projecting down to two dimensions and I'm looking at how much of the volume is being projected within a circle of radius uh, r um, as a fraction of the total radius. And here you can see that it's really the opposite thing that's happening. So as I'm increasing p, I'm getting more and more of the volume pushed into towards the center. And so again, 100 is a really extreme case and you can see that um, already one quarter of the total radius contains almost the full volume of that uh, projected sphere. Um, and so that's actually uh, going to be a problem for the visualization because that means we're not really using a lot of uh, the plotting space where there's going to be almost none of the volume projected and so none of the sample points. Um, and so what we are proposing is that we can use a radial transformation that will undo this effect. So um, if we know um, how our um, p-dimensional volume is being projected onto the two-dimensional area, we can redistribute the, the radius such that um, we are assigning equal space in the two-dimensional plane um, to equal volume um, from the p-dimensional um, assumed the spherical volume um, in p-dimensions. And so here's what that the transformation uh, then looks like. So what I called Ry here is the the radius uh, in the projection. So how far is um, each of the sample points from the sample mean in the projection? 
and then r is the um, full radius of my hypersphere in p dimensions and then p is the number of dimensions and so here's uh, what that looks like for um, fixing r to to one and then just varying p so from two where there's nothing happening um, up to four six um, ten and twenty dimensions and what you can see is that as I'm increasing the number of dimensions, I'm essentially blowing up the area near um, the center of my distribution. So I can see more closely what's happening in that region. Um, and then I'm distorting things further out. So you can see, for example, here with P equal to 20, um, most of my um, space in RY prime will be for, um, uh, radii up to one half of um, the total radius. Um, a nice way of looking at that is actually to look at what happens to concentric circles when I use my transformation. So um, again, uh, here with p equal to two, nothing much is happening. So these are um, equidistant circles in Ry and also Ry prime uh, in this case. Um, and then as I'm increasing P, uh, I'm really blowing out the center and uh, I start to get distortions near um, the edge of my sample space. So with P equals three, that's still not too extreme, uh, but then P equal to 10 and 100 start to be really um, an extreme transformation, um, especially again with the 100 dimensions, which is really a high number. Um, and so that's something that's gonna be useful in general for looking at projected data. But I think it's especially useful uh, when we're working with tours. Um, so if you're not familiar with what a tour is, that's essentially a way of looking at a high dimensional distribution by looking at a sequence of low dimensional projections. Um, and the main idea is that we're actually interpolating between projections such that we can still make sense of uh, what we're seeing. Um, so what we get is this type of animation. So just the for you to maybe wrap your head around. This is a hypercube in four dimensions. And what we're looking at is just a sequence of two dimensional projections. Um, but because they're interpolated, it's essentially like we're picking up that four dimensional object and rotating, rotating, rotating it around to look at it from different angles, uh, which then uh, can teach us quite a lot about this uh, high dimensional distribution. Um, and I have uh, also uh, two other examples here. So the first one is just points in a hypersphere um, in four dimensions, um, where you can see that uh, nothing of much interest is happening. Um, and then uh, the second one here is actually the same thing, but uh, now I've picked the points in a 10 dimensional hypersphere, um, where we start to see that points uh, pile up near the center much more already. Um, and where we can understand that it's easy to hide the something in, in the hand, near the center of the distribution here. Um, and so that's where the new transformation can be really helpful. Um, sorry, need to probably, ah, there we go. Um, and so here's one example. Uh, so this is the pollen data, which is a simulated data set, but there's some small structure hidden uh, near the center of the distribution. Um, and so this is a multidimensional data set, so we can look at it with the tour. And if we look at it with the standard tour or even with the um, Sage display, but with default parameters, um, this is uh, what that will look like. So you can see that this uh, distribution looks pretty boring. Uh, we don't really see anything interesting going on. And that's really because we have to look uh, near the center to see um, what has been hidden in there for us. Um, and so if I use some of the parameters of my transformation to blow out the center further, um, here's how that can look like. So I've used two different tuning parameters in these two um, animations uh, in the middle and on the right. And what you can see is that the, the transformation will um, start to push out a lot of the points towards the maximum radius which allows us to have a better resolution near the center. Um, and because the transformation is just uh, linear near the center, uh, we can still read off the word that has been hidden inside the distribution for us here. Um, and so in the end, I just wanna show a second um, application that uh, I think is quite interesting. So uh, what we're looking at here is we're trying to use the tour to uh, visually verify some clustering that has been done in a high dimensional space. And what I've done here is I've just selected um, three of the clusters that are shown in color and then everything else is just grayed out. 
Um, and on the left, we have just a standard tour display. Um, and on the right, we have the Sage display. And one thing that we would be interested in is visually, can we um, say that these are separate clusters or um, would we think that these points should be grouped together by the clustering algorithm? Um, and so with the standard tour display, this can be pretty difficult to see because there's just a lot going on in, in the same place near the center. Um, and in particular, um, if we're looking at the Sage display instead, you can see that it becomes much clearer that the um, third cluster that is shown here in green is really separate from the other two, so the blue and the yellow, um, while we can still see the blue and yellow always kind of on top of each other, so maybe those should be grouped together by the clustering. Um, and I have some still views here just to make it easier. So um, my slides are actually linked on my webpage. So you can have a look at that uh, afterwards if you're interested. But I think I'll skip straight to my conclusions here. So um, what I've described today is a new display that aims to reverse the effect of uh, paling um, in the visualization of high dimensional data, um, which we've implemented with uh, tour methods as the Sage tour display. Um, this is actually related to um, the slice tour, which is kind of what came out of that open problem that I had discussed uh, two years ago. Um, and both of those displays I would think of as complementary to nonlinear dimension reduction methods, so um, things like TSNE. Um, and just to give you a bit of an outlook, so what I think would be really useful is to have a, an interactive interface for these displays because they actually do have some tuning parameters. Um, but they are really fast to compute, so that would be a really efficient way of tuning the display. Um, and I think it's also really interesting to think about other types of transformation or slicing methods um, in that direction um, that can really um, take the work further as well. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Ashla. That's really interesting again. Um, does anyone have a quick question for Ashla? You can uh, just unmute yourself, or you can raise your hand, or you can enter it in chat. I, I have a question. Uh, I'm Aurore. I don't know if uh, if someone answers the question, but first of all, great talk. Thanks very much. Very, uh, very refreshing talk. I have a question which is about, do you take into account the distribution of the data on those spheres? Because I, I guess what you've shown us is something like uniformly distributed data on the sphere. So I'm just wondering if the data are not uniformly distributed, do you still need to do the same transformation or should you take the distribution into account? Um, yeah, so I, you're right, uh, because we're just looking at the volume that's essentially saying we're assuming that the points are distributed uniformly and then if they're uniformly in the sphere, they would be uniform in a disk in two dimensions after a transformation. Um, and I think it's interesting to think about different uh, types of distributions and I would actually put that in that um, new transformations for the work uh, part of things. So. Uh, I think if we were able to actually use the empirical distribution um, and use it as an input to a transformation, um, we could get something that's uh, even more useful, um, more along the lines of what uh, methods like TSNI are doing. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ashla. Um, so we will need to move on to the next speaker now. So the next speaker is KD Dane from UTS. So Katie completed her PhD at UNSW Sydney, where she worked on efficient Hamiltonian Monte Carlo algorithms for large data sets by data subsampling. Currently, Katie is a postdoctoral research fellow at University of Technology Sydney. In addition to her research on Bayesian computation methods for large data, she's also working on Bayesian approaches to analyze multiple outcomes data. So in this talk, Katie will present her recent work on Bayesian structural equation modeling for data from multiple longitudinal studies. Thank you, Katie. It's really my honor to present at the PhD retreat this year, so I'd like to thank the organizer for inviting me. So in the next 10 minutes or so, I would like to share with everyone about a project that I've been doing the past 10 months, during which I've learned a lot, which is a work on Bayesian structure equation modeling for data from multiple color studies. And this is a joint work with our collaborators in the US. <coughs> Uh, so this, uh, this is a photo of the PI of this project. So we have data of 20 years of PIRS, alcohol, spectrum disorders, which is 
uh, the data we're gonna use our models to analyze. Right, so the motivation of this project is that it is well known that high level of creator alcohol exposure would result in serious cognitive and behavioral differences in children. However, the effect at lower dose is not well understood. Partly because it's very difficult to measure cognitive direct cognition directly, so researchers usually have to use um, multiple cognitive and behavioral tests to assess the child's cognitive function. And in, in this paper, we propose a better approach to analyze the shape of the neural response relationship between PAE and cognition. So PAE, PAE is short for prenatal alcohol exposure. And in particular, in this project, we would like to understand whether the effect of PAE and cognition is the same at all level, or whether there's a level below which there's little or no effect. So a little bit more about the data. So we have data from six longitudinal cost studies over the span of 20 years in the United States with a total of more than 2,000 children. So the model was interviewed about the drinking behavior during pregnancies and the participants will follow up at zero age during childhood. And at the time of the follow up, they were gonna go through a number of neural development tests which assess the IQ, learning and memory abilities and capacity functions. So all of these are usually referred to as sub, um, cognitive subdomain, and also it's something that we can't really quantify directly. So the link all these un unobservable latent drivers to the observed products of the test result, we propose to use a structural equation model on SEM. So SEM is the very commonly used um, techniques in social sciences to um, to fit structure of a network of structures to data or to analyze data with multiple outcomes. The best way to explain the SEM is through a diagram like this. So this is something that we, this is a simplified version of what we try to fit in this data. So we have the observed test results for a person, I, in uh, one of the cohorts. So that number of tests in the box, in the, in the square at the bottom. And each of these tests are associated with, associated with one of the uh, cognitive subdomain, either IQ, that's the function of children learning memory. And all of these subdomains are related to the latent cognition driver, which you're going to model as a function of the creator co exposure and the propensity score that captures the components. So I don't need a light diagram. Uh, to fit the model, we just write this. Diagram the previous slide as three equations I'm showing here. So I'm not going to go through all the details of this equation. There's a lot of Greek letters. I just want to point out that so for person I in uh, class C, we observe a uh, vector of outcome, which we call ICI, and the PAE level, which is X. And the first two equations explain the structural relationship between Y, the observed outcome. The latent variables representing the cognitive subdomain side and the cognition variables um, LCI. So this is just a relative score that measures a person's cognitive ability. So the larger the value, the higher they'll be. And you'll notice that in the first two equations, all the parameters are cohort specific that will allow us to have different number of outcomes uh, for different cohorts. And then the last equation is uh, representing the the response curve between the cognition driver ARCIs and the alcohol exposure level XCI. So we're going to model ARCI as a function of the alcohol levels and to assess, to answer our questions of whether there's a level below which there's no effect going to be. We want to compare between two candidate models. The first one, which is called M1, is basically uh, using a piecewise linear regression equation. So we're going to have to find a level XPP, which is a parameter, the parameter we're going to estimate, after which the effect change by beta 2. And the other models simply uh, assume the linear relationship between uh, XCIs and LCIs, and its effect is constant. So that was the 
the first time we look at this, it doesn't look very difficult. Uh, there's like 10,000 no parameter to estimate, but uh, that's not really a problem. And actually, there's software to do SEM. However, uh, we can't really use uh, all these existing tools for this project because of several reasons. First of all, we want to make inference about the latent factors, but the existing software does not provide estimate of that because they kind of cheat uh, kind of integrating all these uh, factors in the estimation procedures. And also, uh, we don't have a lot of options in modeling the relationship between the latent driver and other exogenous drivers. So the only thing we can have is linear model. So we can't use the existing tool to estimate the model with the breakpoint. Also, each cohort study has a large number of tests, at least 20, but the set of tests are not entirely the same for all cohorts, and the existing package for multiple SEM requires the same number of uh, outcome measure for each group. And also, the number of participants in each study is not very large compared to the number of outcome measures and the total number of parameters we need to estimate. So, um, using the maximum likelihood estimate is not really a good choice. Also, there are a large number of participants with incomplete data, so there are a lot of participants where we don't observe all the test outcomes. There's a lot of missing in the data. So, so the way to go with it is going to use a Bayesian approach to estimate this model, which we, 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 uh, we believe is the best way to estimate this model, first of all. We can really model and estimate the breakpoint together with the rest of the parameters. We have a lot of flexibility in modeling the functional form of the, the response curve. We can sample the latent drivers, the latent collision drivers in our MCMC. And Bayesian's um, SEM or Bayesian modeling in, in general is suitable for small sample size. And also, it's straightforward to deal with um, missing data in the Bayesian context. However, uh, there's not a lot of literature on model selection for Bayesian SEM, and after a lot of trial and errors, we settled with WASC and base vectors. And also, because of the dimensional of the problem, computing the base vector was pretty computationally intensive. Next slide. All right, so I think uh, that's enough about the methods. I'm going to show you the results that we have here. So, what I have here is um, the posterior mean of the later transmission score on the y axis. And our, our measure of creator of the exposure on what on the on the axis. So this is the posterior mean for all uh, individuals, and the color of the dot indicate which cohort the person come from. The red light is the estimate door responder. So in the left panel, I have the door responder corresponding to this linear model M1. And the right panel is a linear model. And the first look you can see that these two models look very much similar to each other, and in fact, the base factor is very close to one, which makes sense in this case because um, because if we zoom in the in the linear in the this one linear model, we you see that we don't really have a lot of data at extreme level of algorithm exposure, so it's very hard to really estimate the breakpoint. And so, if you have a closer look at the door response code, you see a lot of um, the, the curve doesn't really change sharply around the estimate breakpoint, which is represented by the blue light, but it kind of changes smoothly between 0.5 and 1.5. But it's clear from both models that there's a negative effect of PAE on high cognition, even at this lower level of. Uh, Prenatal alcohol exposure, so please think, drink, think carefully before you drink. Uh, next slide, please. So, I think I've run out of time, so just a few things to wrap up my presentation. So, this is the work where we propose a way to uh, model to analyze the relationship between PAE and time conditions. This is not the end of our task yet because there's still a few things that we haven't addressed in this current model. Well, the thing is computation is very slow due to the size of the parameter space. It takes four hours, so we are exploring other options that might speed up the estimation of the models. Um, SEM model in general is pretty restricted, so we are also looking at ways to relax some of the assumptions or using a better measure of PAE, uh, which will relate 
which requires to recomputing the propensity score. And currently, is the propensity score is estimated in separate state. And we are also looking into a way, different ways to incorporate uh, yes, this estimation of propensity score into one of models. So yeah, thank you for your attention. I come to the end of my talk. Thank you so much, Katie. So next up, we have Dr. Melissa Humphreys from the University of Adelaide. Melissa is an ex-chef, wannabe psychologist that got a bit lost in mathematics and on the way. She's a statistician and lecturer at the University of Adelaide, who currently researches predominantly in forensic sciences. Her talk is titled, Counting Our Virus in Dung, An Introduction to Wastewater-Based Epidemiology. Thank you, Melissa. Um, I'm here to talk to you today a bit about the um, stories that you might have seen in the news um, about finding COVID in wastewater. And if you looked closely at those stories, you will have seen that they didn't claim anything much more than that. They just said, we found it. And they don't make claims about how much um, is in the community. And that's because actually right now, we just can't do that. Um, so this talk in a bit of a change of pace is going to be an introduction to wastewater-based epidemiology. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about, you know, the history of it and why it's an interesting thing to do and then kind of, and the challenges associated with that. And then at the end, we'll come back to the additional challenges associated with measuring COVID in wastewater and why we can't make any more statements um, greater than, you know, we found it. So uh, wastewater-based epidemiology has been um, growing in popularity over the last decade or so. And actually uh, it's used to measure things in the population that are not easy to measure otherwise. For example, um, saying, hey, come over here, fill out this survey about your drug using habits is not something that people willingly involve themselves in usually. And so like our asymptomatic COVID individuals, there's a huge part of the drug using population that we just don't know anything about. And so measuring wastewater is a way of getting an unbiased estimate about the whole drug using population rather than just one um, part of it. So the Australian government samples wastewater quarterly across the whole um, country at a number of wastewater treatment plants around the country. Um, this is something that a lot of countries do. Um, <clears throat> and this gives us a way of estimating prevalence of different illicit drugs and alcohol and stuff in the community um, across entire populations. The beauty of sampling a wastewater treatment plant is that there is a well-defined region that contributes to the wastewater treatment plant. So this um, figure here is the major wastewater treatment plant catchments for South Australia. Um, and if you know census data, then you can have an estimate of the contributing population within those boundaries. However, this doesn't take into account people who would be traveling in for work and then going home or um, tourists, you know, vacations, festivals, all of these things can distort the size of the population that is contributing to the sample. So already, before we even get started, we can see that there are challenges associated with taking something that you've seen in wastewater and making some sort of comment about prevalence within the community, especially on a per capita basis. Um, this is an active area of research in just trying to figure out how to define the population um, properly. So let's talk about what we're actually measuring. So you take some illicit drugs, uh, uh, my first of a couple of really fantastic graphics that I've drawn. Um, so you take some illicit drugs, you metabolize those drugs, and then you pee out the metabolized version of the drug. It then travels from your home to the wastewater treatment plant, at which point, upwards of two days later, it arrives and we can take a sample. Now, there are two main ways of taking a sample. The best practice way is using 24-hour composite sampling. This involves setting up an expensive sampling machine at the inlet of the wastewater treatment plant that will take continual samples that are relative to the flow that's coming in through the pipe. It goes into a holding tank over the space of 24 hours, and then you take a sample from that little holding tank, and that is your 24 hour composite sample that is meant to be representative, a snapshot of that day. A less expensive way of sampling is to go straight to the wastewater treatment plant's holding tank. So when the wastewater arrives, it goes into a holding tank. You just take a sample from that. This is called a grab sample. The problem with that is that 
the holding tank is usually only full for three to six hours and then it pushes through for treatment to the wastewater treatment plant. So if you're taking a grab sample, you're only getting a snapshot of three to six hours of the day. So at this point, it should be clear that before we've even got our sample, there's a whole bunch of things that need to be taken into account if you want to be able to make statements about, um, you know, back transforming the levels that you see to something about what has actually happened in the population. There's a whole process of degradation that takes place in the time from when the sample enters the system until it arrives at the wastewater treatment plant. There are issues associated with which type of sampling regime that you've chosen. If you've chosen a grab sample, is this going to be representative of the broader population or have you sampled at, a, at the right time to be able to get the snapshot that you want? And then on top of that, once you've got the samples, you have to get them to the lab to be analysed. That can take time. There's only a couple of labs in Australia that do the analysis. So, have they been frozen, for example, and has that damaged the composition of what's in the sample? All of this stuff needs to be taken into account and factored into any equations that you're using to back transform what you've observed into something that is measurable about what was actually in the population. And this process is fairly well defined for illicit drugs. So, you know, um, we know quite a lot about this, but there are other problems with illicit drugs that complicate the matter further. For example, the metabolites of some drugs are the same as the parent compound. So we cannot tell the difference between something that's been dumped and something that's been consumed. Another problem is that the mass spectrometer that you use to, to um, analyze the sample, there's a lower limit below which they can't actually see anything in the sample. So you do get distributions that are truncated where you just never observe the tail of the distribution. And all of this stuff kind of complicates the process of being able to make meaningful statements about prevalence within the community. So as an example of what a simple question in drug use, this is um, some data, a snapshot of the data that my PhD student Saka is working on at the moment with our collaborator, Richard. Um, the, the very simple research question is, was methamphetamine use different in the COVID months? And the last two box plots here are those COVID months, April and June, this is the samples. Uh, this is the quarterly sample data that we have from the Australia um, data set. And you might look at this and go, oh, well, that's easy. We can, we can analyze that, surely. But how would you analyze that? You need to notice here that there's actually some missing data. So this is not a time series, it is not complete. Within each month, there are seven consecutive days sampled but it's not the same seven days every month and you never find out which days they actually are. You just know that they are consecutive, right? There is for a lot of drugs variability within a week. So you have like cyclical weekly variability. There is also seasonal variability across a year that needs to be taken into account. And then you can also see that, you know, there are what you would call in time series like shocks to the system. And sometimes you can explain shocks as, you know, big festivals or New Year's Eve, sometimes you can't explain those shocks and you're never going to get the information about things like major drug seizures that might have caused um, decreases that you see in your data. So answering this very simple research question becomes much more complicated. And you might also notice that in the um, words down the bottom, I've said concentration for state two. And so if you were thinking at some point here, oh, well, you could do like spatial correlates and look at, you don't actually get to know what state is which. And so incorporating any spatial structures is also really challenging because you don't have any underpinning knowledge of where the samples have come from. Okay, so you can see that this is a really challenging space and it's challenging in, in the illicit drug space where we have been doing this for a decade and we know lots of stuff about it already. So then you come to COVID, another one of my fabulous graphics there, um, you come to COVID where we know even less about the nature of the thing. Now we're not dealing with uh, metabolites anymore, we're dealing with a virus and so we're looking at the RNA of the virus and this graphic here is meant to depict a red squiggly virus coming into your body, it might get into your cells and when it's in the cell it might replicate and then a cell might pass on those replicates into your body and then it comes out in your solid waste. So we're not looking at 24 hour composite samples of water anymore, we're looking at grab samples of solid waste. Um, and then we just kind of decompose that looking for snippets of the RNA that match with what we know the RNA of COVID looks like. And so we can say when we look at the sample, was COVID in there, yes or no? We don't know 
how often people shed. We don't know that the, the passing on of the virus is called shedding. We don't know whether it's the same for asymptomatic people and symptomatic people. Because we're using grab samples, which because they're cheaper, we can do that much more readily across like regional centers and things as well. And we get, you know, the, the solid waste. Um, it's only representative of that small time period. Is that representative of the, of the population at large? Um, you know, if we don't see anything, does that mean that there's nothing in the population or does it mean that we just haven't sampled at the right time on this particular day? There's all these questions associated with COVID that we just don't have the answers to yet. Um, some of these questions can't be answered by the statisticians. We've got to wait for the biologists to get on top of this stuff before we can start doing some cool stuff with the analysis. Okay, so where are we at? Um, COVID in wastewater is more like an early warning detection system at the moment. We can test it, see whether there's something there, yes or no. If we find it, then we can do further testing within the community to try and find out the source of the thing. So I was involved in some discussions in, with Fiji about how they're going to manage this when they open up their borders. And they're talking about measuring um, the wastewater from cruise ships and airplanes and things to try and get an idea of whether anybody on those vessels have got um, COVID <clears throat> so that they can monitor that more effectively. There is, of course, I mean, regular sampling happening, and this is happening in, in multiple countries. And so regions like the UK and the US and so many other countries in the world right now that have so many COVID cases might end up in the coming months having a data set that is a little richer, that can start looking like a time series that we might be able to analyze and statistically look at the relationship between that and the measurements that we're getting from other sources. And so this sort of stuff might come out, but in Australia, you know, our data set really has no information because we really have no cases. And so I just want to finish the talk by saying thank you, Melbourne, for being awesome and staying home and keeping the rest of us safe. It's literally the only time that I'm really happy to have a non-informative data set. <laughs> and that's it. Thanks very much. So here's questions from Walter. You're welcome to unmute your microphone and ask it directly. Sorry, what was that? I'm just saying people can unmute and ask you your question directly. Um. I will just say, if nobody's going to say anything, that I want to just shout out to Warish Ahmed, who answered lots of emails from me with questions about COVID in wastewater. This is a really good review article of where the field is at in Australia right now about um, measuring COVID in wastewater, if anybody's interested in following up. Awesome. Thank you. Well, we might be oh. on to our... Is there a question? I have a question. Yes. Yeah. Um, Mel, how optimistic is the group on using this going forward for COVID? Uh, globally, I guess. Okay. So for... I don't know whether you could hear that. It was a question from the audience in Adelaide. So the question was how optimistic are people about using this um, going forward globally? Um, I mean, given the, given the success in using it for things like illicit drugs, I think there's a lot of um, optimism around making it work, but there is a lot of groundwork that has to happen first in understanding the virus and understanding, you know, who sheds and how it sheds and modeling those rates. And, you know, so um, whether that happens before we get things like vaccinations and I mean I don't know but there's a lot of time and effort going into trying to do this right now. Awesome thank you so much Melissa that was a great talk. Yeah. So our final speaker for this session is Dr Xiaodong Mao from the University of Melbourne. Xiaodong is a postdoctoral research fellow working with Roar Delego at the University of Melbourne. He completed his PhD in statistics just this year, so congratulations. He's interested in exploring different types of complex data arising in real-world applications. His current research interests include non-parametric estimation for streaming data and functional data analysis. And in this talk, Xiaodong will present one of his PhD research projects on non-parametric regression estimation for streaming data. Thank you so much, Dr. Xiaodong. Uh, thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, this is a, 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 a project from my uh, PhD uh, thesis. So it's on. Uh, oh, sorry. Sorry, this is the first time I do a talk with my uh, daughter by my side. So. Okay. Yeah. 
So this is a, a, a in collaboration with Aurora, uh, my PhD supervisor, and uh, Felix, my uh, co-supervisor, who's currently working in uh, Canada. Uh, so my, my PhD thesis is about streaming data. So in, uh, I thought about uh, how to define streaming data uh, uh, to a broader audience, but uh, so I think instead of giving a formal definition, I, I'm going to give you some typical scenarios. And one uh, typical scenario is from uh, uh, Twitter. So I, I just found this reference yesterday. So this uh, paper uh, is about using Twitter for predicting stock prices. So uh, the idea is you get some uh, 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 real time, uh, you get some tweets uh, by API, uh, real time tweets from Twitter, and you use some text mining uh, uh, techniques to analyze, to analyze people's sentiment towards certain uh, companies. For example, how people feel about IBM or Microsoft. And then you use that uh, to predict the, the, the stock prices uh, of these companies. Or a more, re a more relevant example is you use uh, people's sentiment uh, on Twitter to predict the, the, the election results. So that's uh, very relevant uh, these two days. Uh, so here, streaming data refers to the streams of tweets, uh, and the goal is to predict the, the stock prices. So that's a typical scenario. So, uh, uh, tip, so other scenarios include, uh, so all kinds of, you can find all kinds of examples involving real-time decision-making based on streams of data uh, in real life. And that kind of data, that kind of data brings uh, some challenges to conventional data analysis because first, you cannot afford to store all the past data, and even if you can, you don't want to because uh, you, you don't have to, because what you are interested in is real time decision making. So if you have an algorithm that can analyze the data in real time uh, and help you make decisions, and you don't need to store all the past data, and the second challenge is. Uh, non-stationarity. So because typically people's attitudes towards say Microsoft uh, is time varying, is slightly shifting. So your algorithm has to uh, consider that and be adapted to the to the potential potential changes in your, in your data. And in my thesis I look at the uh, uh, non-parametric curve estimation problem for uh, streaming data. And it's a classical uh, a topic in statistics and uh, you may have seen uh, pictures like these from uh, textbooks and, and research papers. So typically you, you observe data from a distribution X and you want to estimate the uh, density of the distribution, probability, density function of the, uh, of the, of the random variable, or you observe X and Y um, uh, 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 in pairs and you want to estimate a smooth, smooth curve from the, uh, from the uh, scatter plot. And this is a very uh, uh, standard topic in statistics. And we, we understand it very well. Uh, but the reason why I want to write another thesis on this topic is because I realized that although we statisticians understand it very well, but in the broader science community, for example, for data scientists or, 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 or people in machine learning, uh, many of them still don't have don't know the usefulness of, of these tools. So, for example, you can actually use, these are actually very good tools to provide you with summary of your data, to visualize your data, and you can even use the density or regression estimates as inputs for your uh, classification or clustering uh, algorithm. And you can even use them for neural networks to start uh, to to con construct neural networks neural networks. So there are still a lot of uh, possibilities of, of using these basic uh, tools. So my goal of my PhD thesis is to adapt these tools for, for streaming data. And uh, uh, data and model, so, so we observe, so in this talk I'm going to look at the, uh, I'm going to introduce the regression uh, problem. So instead, we observe x's and y's. So instead of observing them uh, at once with a fixed sample size n, we observe them uh, sequentially. So uh, at each time ti, we observe one of them. And we assume that xi has a density, but the density depends on, on time, on t. 
So it's no, it's no longer the, 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 the conventional IID data set we typically have. And also we assume that the, the relation between X and Y can be summarized by a regression function N and the regression function also depends on T. So everything here is, is uh, time varying and smoothly time varying. And the goal is to estimate the regression curve N non-parametrically and in, in real time. So, uh, so first we need an estimator and uh, I, I tried uh, uh, some different, several different estimators and it turns out that this one uh, works good, it uh, works well in, in simulation studies. So this one is basically an extension of the classic Nadaraya Watson uh, estimator uh, for kernel regression. Uh, and it can be written as a, a ratio of R and F. And both parts, both R and F can be uh, computed recursively. So what we do here is how do you compute a new uh, uh, estimator? You take, so at time ti, we observe xi and yi, the new data point. And we give the older uh, estimate, so the estimator from one step before, a weight slightly less than one. And we give the new data point a weight, gamma, and we do a linear combination of these two. So this term here represents the, the information you, you have, the summary of the information you have from the past data. And this term here represents the uh, information you have from the new data point. So you do that, so you can update your estimator recursively. And uh, uh, the, the good thing about this, another good thing about this estimator is you can weigh down your past data, data points uh, exponentially fast. So you forget your past data points because the data, remember the data are, are non-stationary. So you want to forget the past and only remember the, the, the recent data points. Uh, so, so that's a, a, a useful estimator, but the, the key problem in practice is how to select gamma and H. So how fast you want to forget the past and how much smoothness you want to give to your, to your data. So how to select gamma and H. And the idea of, of my algorithm comes from a machine learning uh, area called ensemble learning. So the idea is instead of calculating only one estimator with one choice of gamma and H parameters, you calculate a collection of them. You, co you collect an ensemble of them and each one of them can be recursively updated. And you uh, choose the best estimator from the collection adaptively using an, a, a cross validation that can be computed in a, uh, uh, in a very in an online fashion. So, so, so that's the, the, the basic uh, uh, idea. And uh, the algorithm can be summarized into a flow chart. So from the flow chart, you can see the inputs and the output. So the input is the uh, sequentially available data points. Each time TI you observe a data point and the output is the uh, 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 updated estimator. So at every, t at every time TI, you update your estimator and you output that estimate. So first we initialize the, the ensemble. So uh, the collection of, of estimators with a grid of, uh, so each um, estimator in the ensemble has corresponds to one choice of gamma and H and you have a grid of gamma and H values uh, there. So after in initializing, you update your ensemble. You remember we can update the estimator recursively in the ensemble. And at the same time, we also check if the grid we're currently using, I gamma and H is still good. So if it, it turns out that, that, that the current ensemble is fine, we can still use it. Then we continue, then, then here, yes, we, we continue this iteration uh, by updating and outputting the selected uh, estimator. But if not, then we do two things uh, simultaneously. First, we still update the existing ensemble because although we know that this ensemble might not be that good, but we, we are doing things in, a, in an online uh, fashion, so we cannot stop. We cannot stop, so we still use the, uh, uh, the current uh, uh, slightly suboptimal uh, ensemble. 
But at the same time, we initialize and update an alternative ensemble with a different uh, selection of gamma and H. So then after some time, we decide if we want to replace the current ensemble with the alternative ensemble. And if we decide to do so, we replace it and we use the new ensemble and new parameters to update uh, and to, ch to choose from. And if not, we simply delete the alternative ensemble and the alternative grid of gamma and H values, and we carry on using the existing ensemble. So uh, it turns out that this algorithm works pretty well. And uh, the idea is inspired by this very classic paper in streaming data analysis, in the sense that uh, 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 we, we compute alternative, we use an ensemble and we compute an alternative ensemble and we compare them periodically to see if we want to uh, replace the original ensemble with the alternative one. So that uh, idea is from an uh, existing paper, but everything else is, is, uh, is completely new. So uh, in, yeah, I'm just going to show you maybe one simulation uh, example. So in this example, we have 5,000 data points uh, and the excess are from an armor uh, model, a time series model. And the true uh, regression curve is, is a sine curve, but with time varying period and location. So both the, the period and the location are, are changing. And if you plot the, so, so this, this is the uh, plot of, of the axis, but if you plot the scatter plot of all the axes and the y's, it's a mess. You can see uh, almost no pattern from this plot because the true curve is, is shifting. So, so, so if you simply plot all the data points together, you, you can't see the, the pattern. Uh, but if you use the, uh, the, the algorithm I, I said before, you can give some pretty robust uh, estimates. So the blue ones, uh, so the red ones are the truth and the blue ones are the uh, uh, estimates from, uh, from my algorithm. And the blue ones are, are, are fairly close to the, to the truth and I also showed some alternative uh, uh, estimates and some alternative methods. And you can see that, for example, the green estimator, it doesn't, it's not so robust because sometimes it gives you uh, spikes like this. So uh, uh, it's, 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 not, it's not so good compared to, to, to our estimator. And you can also apply that to some real data sets. And here the data sets, is the the other data set include example uh, including stock prices from Microsoft and Intel. You can you can analyze the relation between those two stocks in, in real time using the the proposed uh, algorithm. And uh, yeah, that's it. And thank you for your uh, attention. And sorry for the, the noises. Thanks very much, Nezan. That was impressive multitasking, being able to keep talking while well, attend to the baby at the same time. Yeah, there, there was a request, yeah, there was a request to show the baby, but uh, <laughs> that's up to you. Um, are there any other questions for Jadon? Oh, so gorgeous. Hello. <laughs> then, thank you again, Jadon. That was really great. Um, so Thank please you. join me in thanking all the speakers again for their very interesting talks.